Muhammad Ali born Cassius Marcellus Clay in Louisville, Kentucky on January 17, 1942, grandson of a slave, began boxing at the age of 12 and by 18 had fought 108 amateur bouts. How is it possible that the young man who in his 20s would astonish the world with not just his, the brilliance of his boxing but the sharpness of his wit seems to have been a dull average student in high school who graduated 376th out of a class of 391? Question mark. In 1966, his score on a mental aptitude test was an Army IQ of 78, well below military qualifications. In 1975, Ali confessed to a reporter that he can't read too good, and he had not read ten pages of all the material written about him. I have remembered the television interview in which, asked what else he might have done with his life, Ali paused for several seconds, clearly not knowing how to reply. All he'd ever known, he said finally, was boxing. Mental aptitude tests cannot measure genius except in certain narrow ranges, and the genius of the body, the play of lightning swift reflexes coupled with unwavering precision and confidence eludes comprehension. All great boxers possess this genius which scrupulous training hans, but can never create. Styles make fights, as Ali's great trainer Angela Dundee says, and style was young Ali's trademark. Yet even after early wins over such veterans as Archie Moore and Henry Cooper, the idiosyncrasies of Ali's style aroused skepticism in boxing experts. After winning the Olympic gold medal in 1960, Ali was described by A. J. Liebling as skittering, like a pebble over water. Everyone could see that this brash young boxer held his hands too low. He leaned away from punches instead of properly slipping them. His jab was light and flicking. He seemed to be perpetually on the brink of disaster. As a 7-1 underdog in the first title fight with Sonny Liston, the 22-year-old challenger astounded the experts with his performance, which was like none other they had ever seen in the heavyweight division. He so outboxed and demoralized Liston that Liston quit on his stool after the sixth round. A new era in boxing had begun, like a new music. Ali rode the crest of a new wave of athletes, competitors who were both big and fast. Ali had a combination of size and speed that had never been seen in a fighter before, along with incredible will and courage. He also brought a new style to boxing. Jack Dempsey changed fisticuffs from a kind of constipated science, where fighters fought in a tense defensive style to a wild, sensual assault. Ali revolutionized boxing the way black basketball players have changed basketball today. He changed what happened in the ring and elevated it to a level that was previously unknown. Larry Merchant quoted in Muhammad Ali. In the context of contemporary boxing, the sport is in one of its periodic slumps. There is nothing more instructive and rejuvenating than to see again these old early fights of Ali when as his happy boast had it, he floated like a butterfly and stung like a bee, and threw punches faster than his opponents could see, like the mystery right to the temple of Liston that felled him in the first minute of the first round of their rematch. These early fights, the most brilliant being against Cleveland Williams in 1966, predate by a decade the long, grueling, punishing fights of Ali's later career, whose accumulative effects hurt Ali irre irrevocably, resulting in what doctors call his Parkinsonism to distinguish it from Parkinson's disease. There is a true visceral shock in observing a heavyweight with the grace, agility, swiftness of hands and feet, defensive skills, ring cunning of a middleweight Ray Robinson or a lightweight Willie Pep. Like all great athletes, Ali has to be seen to be believed. In a secular yet pseudo-religious and sentimental nation like the United States, it's quite natural that the sports stars emerge as heroes, legends, icons. Who else? George Santayana described religion as another world to live in, and no world is so set off from the disorganization and disenchantment of the quotidian than the world, or worlds of sports. Hauser describes in considerable detail the transformation of the birth of Ali out of an unexpectedly stubborn and idealistic will of young Cassius Clay. 
but how immediately following his first victory over Liston, he declared himself a convert to the nation of Islam, more popularly known as the Black Muslims, and no longer a Christian. He repudiated his slave name of Cassius Marcellus Clay to become Muhammad Ali, a name which, incidentally, the New York Times, among other censorious white publications, would not honor through the 1960s. Ali became virtually overnight a spokesman for the black America as no other athlete, certainly not the purposely reticent Joe Lewis, had ever done. I don't want to be what you want me to be, he told white America. I'm free to be me. Two years later, refusing to be inducted into the army to fight in Vietnam, Ali, beleaguered by reporters, uttered one of the most memorably, memorable and centenary remarks of that era. Man, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. How ingloriously white America responded to Ali, the government retaliated by overruling a judge who had granted Ali the status of conscientious objector, fined Ali $10,000, and sentenced him to five years in prison. He was stripped of his heavyweight title and deprived of his license to box. Eventually, the U.S. Supreme Court would overturn the conviction, and as the tide of opinion shifted in the country in the early 1970s, as the Vietnam War wound down, Ali returned triumphantly to boxing again and regained the heavyweight title not once, but twice. Years of exile, during which he endured the angry self-righteousness of the conservative white press, seemed wonderfully not to have embittered him. He had become a hero. He had entered myth. Yet the elegaic title of Angela Dundee's chapter in Dave Anderson's In the Corner, we never saw Muhammad Ali at his best defines the nature of Ali's sacrifice for his principles and the loss to boxing. When, after a three-and-a-half-year layoff, Ali returned to the ring, he was, of course, no longer the seemingly invincible boxer he'd been. He'd lost his legs, thus his primary line of defense. Like the maturing writer who learns to replace the incandescent head-on energies of youth with what is called technique, Ali would have to descend into his physical being and experience for the first time, the punishment, the nearest thing to death, that is a, the lot of the great boxer willing to put himself to the test. As Ali's personal physician at the time, Ferdi Pacheco, said, Ali discovered something which was both very good and very bad. Very bad in that it led to the physical damage he suffered later in his career. Very good that it eventually got him back to the championship. He discovered that he could take a punch. The secret of Ali's mature success and the secret of his tragedy. He could take a punch. For the remainder of his 20 year career, Muhammad Ali took punches, many of the kind that, delivered to a non boxer, would kill him or her outright. From Joe Frazier in their three exhausting marathon bouts, from George Foreman, from Ken Norton, Leon Spinks, Larry Holmes, where in his feckless youth, Ali was a dazzling figure combining, say, the brasses of Hotspur and the insouciance of Lear's Fool. He became in these dark, brooding, increasingly willed fights the closest analogy boxing contains to Lear himself. Or rather, since there is no great fight without two great boxers, the title matches Ali Frazier 1, which Frazier won by a decision, and Ali Frazier 3, which Ali won just barely when Fraser Lee virtually collapsed after the 14th round, are boxing's analogies to King Lear, or deals of unfathomable human courage and resilience raised to the level of classic tragedy. These somber and terrifying boxing matches make us weep for the very futility we seem to be in the presence of human experience too profound to be named. Beyond the strategies and diminishments of language, the mystic's dark night of the soul transmogrified is a brutal meditation of the body. And Ali Foreman, Zaire, 1974, the occasion of the infamous Robodope defense by which the 32-year-old Ali exhausted his 26-year-old opponent by the inspired method of simply and horribly allowing himself to punch himself out on Ali's body and arms. This is a fight of such magical quality that even to watch it closely is not to see how it was done, its fairy tale reversal in the eighth round executed. One of Norman Mailer's most impassioned books, The Fight, is about this fight 
watching a tape of Ali on the ropes enticing, infuriating, and frustrating, and finally exhausting his opponent by an offense in the guise of a defense, I pondered what sly lessons of, of masochism Mailer absorbed from being at ringside that day, what deep imprinted resolve to outwear all adversaries. These hard-won victories began irreversible loss, progressive deterioration of Ali's kidneys, hands, reflexes, stamina. By the time of that most depressing of modern-day matches, Ali Holmes, 1980, when Ali was 38 years old, Freddy Pacheco had long departed the Ali camp, dismissed for having advised Ali to retire. Those who supported Ali's decision to fight, like the bout promoter Don King, had questionable motives. Judging from Hauser's information, it is a wonder that Ali survived this fight at all. The fight was, in Sylvester Stallone's words, like watching an autopsy on a man who's still alive. In The Black Lights, Hauser describes the bedlam that followed this vicious fight at Caesar Palace, Las Vegas, where gamblers plunged into an orgy of gambling, as if in a frenzy of feeding or copulation. Ali and Holmes had done their job. Incredibly, Ali was allowed to fight once more with Trevor Burbick in December 1981 before retiring permanently. Hauser's portrait of Ali is compassionate and unjudging. Is the man to be blamed for having been addicted to his body's own adrenaline, or are others to be blamed for indulging him and exploiting him? The brash rap style egoism of young Cassius Clay underwent a considerable transformation during Ali's long public career, yet strikes us perhaps as an altered only in tone. Boxing was just to introduce me to the world, Ali told his biographer. Mystically involved in the nation of Islam, Ali sincerely believes himself an international emissary for peace, love, and understanding. He who once wreaked such habit upon his opponents, and who is presumed to feel sorry for one, will not feel sorry for himself. This is the end of The Cruelest Sport Part 2. Look for Part 3.